right, so now that we've discussed some basics of how light works and how the absorption versus reflection can impact our eye, let's talk about the eye. The eye is a fascinating organ in our body. It's uh, definitely evolved in some really neat ways. Uh, and it, it, there's lots of different things we can talk about the eye, but for the purpose of this course, we're gonna limit it to the regions kind of highlighted here, uh, the cornea, iris, pupil, lens, retina, fovea, and optic nerve. So let's get to it. So the cornea for our purposes in this course is pretty basic. The cornea is just the transparent covering, uh, it covers the anterior chamber of the eye, that's everything before the lens. Uh, and where it really can impact our sense of vision is if we get a scratch or injured, it's, it's going to be painful uh, and it's going to possibly blur uh, our sense of, of sight. Uh, so you want to protect your corneas. If this, if you are a person who wears contact lenses, you are frequently touching your sclera and your corneas and, and you have to be really careful when you're picking that off. Um, but it's it's a kind of a little bit of a seal. It's kind of like a screen protector on your cell phone. Then behind the cornea, this is the part uh, where people talk about their color of their eye, what color is your eye. We're really talking about the color of your iris. And so the iris is this really fascinating structure made up of all kinds of layers, including a fibrovascular layer and the stroma, which is really a sphincter that can open and close. Uh, and so when this iris opens and closes, uh, this can really change how much light can pass through the eye. So when we refer to constriction, what we're talking about is when uh, the pupil becomes smaller and the disc or the iris part becomes more noticeable and larger. So this is when you can really see the color of someone's blue or green or brown eyes. Um, and so constriction is when the iris becomes larger, the pupil becomes smaller, and this is when less light will enter the eye. Then we have dilation. So this is when the iris becomes more thin uh, and the pupil in the center becomes bigger. And this allows for more light to enter the eye. So obviously the iris is here kind of shaping what will happen to the pupil. And so the pupil is the hole in the middle of the iris, allowing the light to pass through. And during constriction, as mentioned, uh, this is when the pupil becomes smaller. And so when the pupil becomes smaller, it's very adaptive to do this when there's lots of bright lights around. Uh, you don't want to get overstimulated. Your brain has enough of it. Uh, you only need a little bit of light in bright scenarios. And so when you're overstimulated, it's very normal to see irises get a little bit smaller. You don't want much information going in. You have enough information already. And dilation is the idea that when the pupil gets larger, uh, this is when you may be walking through your house in the dark when the power is out or in the middle of the night, for instance. It allows you to see better in dark because more light is going into your eye. So if you're reading in dim light, you're going to have larger pupils, they'll be dilated. We also know that in a neutral light situation, the pupils can dilate when there is reason for physical arousal. So this could be uh, in a really intense situation if you're writing a test, let's say, and you need to take in more information from the situation, or if you're in a stressful conversation, your eyes may dilate. Uh, we also know uh, that um, love and interest and arousal in that sense can also make the eyes dilate. So after the pupil comes the lens. So as light moves through the pupil and it starts to hit this really fascinating part of our eye that has this ability to change shape when we want to focus on things near or far. And so this is the lens. Uh, so the lens refracts and bends light. And what's fascinating about how our eye has evolved, it is actually inverts our vision. That is the top of your visual field hits the bottom of the back of your eye and the bottom of your visual field hits the top of the back of your eye. Your lens flips everything. And so your lens is the ability to focus on objects near and far uh, by changing its shape and it's focusing like a computer, like a camera lens. That being said, focusing does tend to work differently for different people. And so optimally what we want to see is that the lens will focus light so the light meets at the back of the eye. This top eyeball that I've drawn is our optimal sort of scenario. However, some people are nearsighted and in nearsighted eyes, what happens is the lens will bend light too sharply. And so it, it doesn't meet at the back of the eye. Uh, what happens here is people who are near high, nearsighted are able to see objects that are near, that are up close. They can read books and work, work on their computers, but they have a hard time seeing road signs when they're driving, for instance. They're nearsighted, they, they can't really see far away objects because the lens is bending on the light too sharply. So one of the ways we can correct it is the lens I've drawn here uh, is a concave lens. Now, 
note, uh, my drawing does show the lens in place. And if the lens was actually in place, we would expect the eye, the vision to be corrected. Uh, so I'm showing, I'm showing the eyeball uncorrected, even though the corrected lens is in front of the eye. So yes, you could be uh, critical of how I've drawn this image. Then we have the farsighted eye. And so farsighted eyes, what happens here is the light doesn't bend sharply enough so that the light would focus hypothetically behind the eye. That's where it would meet. And so when it reaches the back of the eye, it's still pretty blurry. So farsighted individuals, they can see far away. They can read things across the room, but they're going to have a hard time reading a novel in their hands. Uh, and so the light does not bend enough. So we can use a convex lens and the convex lens would sharpen that would make it bend more quickly so that it will meet at the back of the eye. Again, I'm showing an uncorrected eye with the corrected lens in front of it. Uh, please note that, that if we actually had those lenses in front of the eyes, we would expect them to look like the top eye. But I'm just showing you the different uh, ways the eyes meet and which shape lenses. We can see how the concave lens and the convex lens, they're bent with different angles. They're, they would reflect light in a different way to compensate uh, for these conditions differently. Now, when the lens uh, reflects light onto the back of the eye, the part of the eye we really want that light to meet at is the retina. So the retina is this thin tissue uh, that is full of photoreceptive neurons. We talked about neurons in units three. It's important to understand that a lot of the neurons we drew there were just one type of, of neuron. The back of the eye has lots of fascinating neurons. Uh, what I've drawn here is the blood vessels at the back of the eye. If you ever go to an optometrist and you get to have a picture taken at the back of the eye, you're going to see these rich blood vessels. And beyond that, you're going to see this tissue with many different types of neurons. We have here little circular ganglion neurons drawn as little gray circles. We have bipolar neurons drawn as more faded purplish gray neurons. But the ones we're really interested in are the rods and cones. And we're going to see they look quite different. The rods are more rod shaped and the cones are more cone shaped. So the rods, we can see here at the, the bottom of the rod, this is uh, sort of their, their terminal buttons. They have the soma, the dark nucleus, and then they have this huge photoreceptive body, which is the rod. And this is really the part that is very receptive to light and particularly receptive to the luminescence or brightness of light. We know that rods are very sensitive to contrast, the difference between lightness and darkness. And so they're really good at picking up on movement when light and dark change in your visual field and picking up on shadows. We also know that in dim light, rods are very essential. For instance, if you're in a dark room in the middle of the night, uh, first things might appear just all, all dark, but then over time, you're going to pick up on even the smallest of contrasts. And that's because the rods can really work over time as your eyes adjust and you can pick up and see the contrast between the furniture and the floor so you don't bump into things in the dark. So just give yourself a couple moments and your rods will really start to work for you. Then we have the cones. The cones sort of look like the rods, only the top where the photoreceptive cells are uh, is more cone shaped. And our cones come in at least three different varieties. Cones uh, more sensitive to blue, more sensitive to green, and more sensitive to red wavelengths of light. And so what's going on here, although some people uh, may have a fourth type of cone, but that's definitely understudied at this point in time. We need to learn more about that. Um, what happens here is the blue cones tend to be more sensitive and they'll fire, make a neural impulse when they interact with blue wave, blue wave wings of light. The green will fire when they are stimulated by green light and the red will fire when they're stimulated by red light. Uh, and so these combinations of these cones will give us lots of information. Now the fovea is one part of our retina, kind of drawn here as a little red circle, just one little part in our retina, right where our central vision shines. And so it's the central pit of the retina. It's where when you're focusing right ahead and you're looking right ahead, that light is meeting the central part of your retina or your fovea. And this part is filled tightly packed with the most uh, per capita quantity of combs. And so what happens here is this is where you get the brightest, more central vision where colors can be seen uh, with the best visual acuity. Now our peripheral vision certainly seems to take in color, but our central vision is actually more efficient at doing it. And if you ever want to see what is going on in your peripheral vision, uh, here, here's a great little exercise for you. So we may not be aware of it, but constantly our eyes are moving and these movements are often called saccades. And so saccades are the idea that I'm certain, even while I'm making these videos, my eyes are probably darting all around the room. 
uh, even though I think I'm just looking at my camera and my screen. And so saccades keep us uh, informed in what's going on in our peripheral vision. If you ever went to a vision test and they had lights flashing on this side, and lights flashing on this side to make sure you had 180 radius degrees of uh, vision, they're testing your peripheral vision. Even though you have to look straight ahead, can you test them? Um, can, can you see what's going on? And so it's just the idea if you see somebody zoom by you on one side, can you detect it? Now, because our eyes are constantly moving around, checking our top and sides of our visions, we think we can see everything. Um, but if you were to actually try and override these automatic movements, if you were to try to consciously control them, if you have a staring contest, if you will, you might be surprised to see what happens to your peripheral vision. And so I encourage you to use this slide. Uh, it's a very colorful slide. And try and look in the most central part of the slide and just stare there for a moment. Uh, even stare there while I'm talking right now. And try to lock your eyes without blinking. It helps if you relax your eyes a little bit. Don't hold them too tensely open. Just relax them and keep them open so you don't have to blink and they don't get too watery. And, and it's safe uh, to hold them there for just a moment and to see what happens. You might find that your vision starts to feel funny. You might find that the things in your peripheral vision seem to flash a little bit or seem to, to waver a little bit. It, it does put strain on your eyes for sure. You can stop if you feel strain. Um, and it's, uh, it's the idea that overriding these saccades is not natural. And the information we think our peripheral eyes are getting, it's actually our central vision. Our central vision is darting around and we're making sure we get new information from our visual focus almost at all times. Um, you may also find that the colors begin to fade a little bit. Not everyone experiences this, but the brightness even on the periphery of this of this video might have faded just slightly for you because you're getting more rods and less cones in your peripheral vision. All right, so move on there, blink a few times, let your eyes relax from that hard work. And now we're going to talk about what happens after the retina and the fovea, where the rods and cones relay this information to, and it goes through a series of different neural networks, but eventually finds its way to the optic nerve. And the optic nerve is what travel transfers the impulses from the retina to the brain. Important to note is that the retina, where it attaches to the back of the eye, actually causes a blind spot. There's actually a spot in the back of our eye that has no rods and no cones. The fovea has lots of cones, but the blind spot has no cones and no rods. There's actually a spot where light hits the back of our eye where we can't detect things. Now, when you look around, I'm sure you don't see like a little black blind spot in your visual field. And that's because of the saccades and also because our brain has learned to adapt and fill in that gap quite nicely. But we all do have that blind spot. Also, we know when people uh, start to develop cataracts or retinal tears, they may not even notice them right away because our brain and our eyes can work overtime to fill in those spots as well. So the optic nerve travels with that information to the brain, but one of the things that really complicates this travel is the optic chiasm. And so the optic chiasm is an X-shaped pathway in the brain. And as we talked about the contralateral effects uh, in Unit 3, we just want to emphasize again, everything you see in your left visual field what your left eye sees on the left side and what your right eye sees on the left side actually travels to the right part of your brain. And everything you see on the right side of your visual field, what your right eye sees on the right side and what your left eye sees on the right side will actually travel to the left part of the brain. It's a very complicated pathway. And it's the idea everything you see on your left is uh, interpreted and perceived on your right occipital lobe and everything you perceive on your right is interpreted and perceived on your left occipital lobe through this x-shaped chamber 